Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the epistle to Titus in our continuing study of the Pauline epistles. Titus himself, that's a Roman name, a very, very common Roman name, I should add. Um, It had both a masculine as well as a feminine form. Uh, Tidia, I think the feminine form was. This is is the masculine. Uh, He accompanied Paul to Jerusalem, where he served as a test case as an uncircumcised Christian. Um, This was back in the uh, the days where the church was saying, no, uh, Christianity is, is from the Jews. Uh, we don't, no Gentiles allowed. If you want to become a Christian, you have to be circumcised, you have to become uh, Jewish, and then you can become a Christian. And, and Paul said, no, that's not true. And here he brought with him Titus saying, look, here's exhibit number one. Um, he's not circumcised. We're not going to go and look, but just take my word for it. Um, and he's also a Christian. <laughs> and, and Titus, I'm sure, was under a lot of pressure to conform, and he did not. Uh, He was one of Paul's special project managers. Uh, When Paul would have an issue here, there, or anywhere, Titus was one of those people that Paul could send and would straighten things out. As our epistle opens, Titus has been left in Crete, uh, right here in the center part of our map. Now, Crete had a—the island had this long, distinguished history. Remember, that was the place where the Minoan civilization had had its roots uh, way back in the second millennia B.C. and and really even earlier. Uh, That had been the center of culture. But that was in its heyday. That was in the past. And after the fall of the Minoan civilization around 1200 B.C., um, Crete became eventually— a haven for pirates, uh, sort of a problem spot. I remember uh, teaching a Bible study in the home of a uh, Greek gentleman, and uh, we actually came to Titus. And I, I mentioned this about Titus being sent to Crete, and he's oh, in his, in his very thick Greek accent, he said, oh, he was brought up from from an early age. Never trust a Cretan. Now I'm not going to go there, but it had a bad reputation, and Paul's going to allude to that here in the epistle to Titus. So he says, for this reason, I left you in Crete. Now, left you sounds a little bit like Paul had been there. The only time we know that Paul had been there had been when he was being taken to Rome to stand trial. Um, So notice, for this reason, I left you in Crete. Was that the time or was there another instance of which we are unaware? And and I don't know. I don't want to say either way because we really don't know. But if that's when it was, that means that Paul, at a later date, uh, goes to Rome, but then is released and does some travels and actually is going to talk about his travel plans, where he plans to stay at a place called Neapolis um, in the, on the western side of Greece. Um, so we'll look at that and we'll ask that question. Well, notice he was, Titus was left in Crete. So he says, so you would set in order what remains. Apparently, there had been some work that had started there, uh, Christians that were there, and appoint elders in every city, not just uh, in one of the particular cities, but in each city, as I directed you. So apparently, there there were churches that were located in a number of cities, and there were elders to be promoted in each of those cities. That's that's Titus's job. And this epistle is going to give him the tools to do that job. You see, it's written to Titus, but this will also be his his article of deputation, where he is authorized by the Apostle Paul. We could call Titus sort of a sub-apostle, a deputized apostle, where he's going to go throughout the cities of Crete, and he will have the authority to appoint elders in each city. So this, the, the epistle begins, Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, and notice how he's called a bondservant. Now, that's just the basic Greek word doulos for slave. Paul, a slave of God. Um, usually when you opened a letter, you would start with all of your exalted titles, uh, like an apostle or imperator or very important person, something like that. But Paul starts off this epistle describing himself as a slave of God, and, and yet, that's a high title, uh, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is, in accord, which is according to godliness. Notice verse 2, in hope of eternal life, and this is what I want to look at, this phrase, which God who cannot lie. Now, there's a wonderful figure of speech there. Uh, Apsudes theos is the Greek word. Um, theos, of course, is the word for God. And pseudes, just without the a in front of it, would be 
the, the Greek word for a liar. You know, when we talk about somebody being pseudo this, like a pseudo intellectual, it means he's not really an intellectual. He's just pretending to be a pretender. And then in Greek, if you put an a in front of a word, it negates it. It's like putting non or anti in, in English in front of a word. And so, <laughs> apsude sias, uh, literally, we could say the non lying God. And I love that because that's a title. That's a title for God. He is the non lying God. But notice the non lying God promised something. <laughs> you know, when, when somebody promises something, the promise is only good as the strength of character of the person doing the promise. Well, we have a promise from the non lying God. I love that. Uh, and he promised long ages ago. Verse 3, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. That's all in the first three verses. That's just one sentence, typical Paul. And so uh, we're going to call this entire um, epistle, this is my title for it, Adorning the Doctrine of God. And I'm actually borrowing the adorning part from something that Paul says in a few places here in this epistle. Uh, he, he's going to use the word adornment, um, the, the cosmos sort of idea. Uh, you look at the adornment of the heavens, uh, but it's also a term that could be used uh, when women put on jewelry and things like that. They are adorning themselves. Well, Paul's going to talk in this epistle about adorning the teachings, the doctrine uh, that God has given. Now, it's divided into two sections. The first chapter is going to talk uh, about leaders, um, both good leaders and bad leaders. And then the second, uh, chapters two and, th and three, we'll talk about everybody else, what we call the laity, just, just the, the, reg the regular people. Now, we have the opening salutation. We just read most of that in verses one through three. And then verse four, he goes on to say to Titus, my true child. And so um, with that, he's now going to launch into this issue. Uh, for this reason, verse five, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Notice the term elders, uh, it's plural. He's not going to appoint, appoint an elder in every city, but rather we have a plurality of leadership which is described. And then he's going to go in verses six through nine, and we'll see the qualifications for those elders and overseers. Now, look at verse 5 again. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And uh, the word, the Greek word elder is just uh, presbyteroi. Um, we, if you've ever heard of the Presbyterian Church, uh, that just means the, the church of elders, the church that is governed by elders. Um, and, and notice, in every city as I directed you, and then he goes on namely, and he begins to list the, the qualifications. If any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, that, that is, the children are not. Uh, and then verse 7 is why we're reading it. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. Now, you say you were appointing elders and describing elders, and now he moves from elders to the overseer. Now, elders was plural. Overseer is singular. Does that mean it is two separate offices? Or is this uh, two different names for the same office? That's a big question. Um, the textbook that we're using for this class actually suggests it's two different offices. And indeed, by the second century, we're going to see that that is the understanding that people in the early church had by the second century. You're going to have Ignatius, for example. He's one of what we call the apostolic fathers. And he is the overseer of the church. And under him, there are elders, and then there are also deacons. So um, notice in, in Ignatius's day, by the second century, and that's early second century too, uh, you had an overseer. Sometimes we translate that bishop. I'm not even sure how we got that word. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, some, some movement in the English language that one word led to another and eventually came out as bishop. Um, I prefer overseer, or episkopos is the, the Greek term. And for that reason, we refer sometimes to the Episcopal Church, not just as a denomination, but as a type of leadership. An Episcopal Church has one person at the top. 
an, an, an episcopus, an overseer. And then under him, he might have elders. And then down below, you have deacons. And then you have the rest of the people. So an episcopal form of church government would be like the Roman Catholic Church or like the Anglican Church, which has one, in the case of the Roman Catholics, is, is one pope. In the case of the Anglican Church, it's one archbishop. Um, but uh, that eventually came to be, and really by the by the the second century, you have at least in each church, you have an episcopos and then elders and then deacons and so on. Um, I'm not sure that they had that as Paul is describing this. I've always looked at this and thought, well, elders and then the overseer, it's just another term for the elder, what the elder is to be like. Um, but admittedly, that's singular and elders is plural. So maybe that is setting up a difference. And so that's the question. Is it one office or two offices that we're looking at? Well, if we go back, elder versus overseer, you know, remember many elders, one overseer, at least that's the way they were doing it by the second century. If we go back to Acts chapter 20, where Paul sent to the, he sent to Ephesus, uh, he was actually at Miletus, and he called to him the elders of the church, and they come to meet him, and he's speaking to them. And as he's speaking to them, he says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, plural. Well, what are they, elders or overseers? And I think Paul would have answered, yes, that's exactly right. They are both. So I think that Paul envisioned, and the very earliest church at least, uh, had had elder slash overseers, um, plural, but it wasn't long before one person began to be looked at as maybe, we would may, say maybe the senior pastor. Um, and I think you even see that in James, where initially you have 12 apostles and you have Peter um, as spokesman for a time, but then later on you have James, uh, the Lord's brother, who seems to be uh, the one that everybody looked to for leadership. And, and I'm not sure why. I'm not. There's no passage that says, from now on, James is going to do it, or from now on, Peter's going to do it. Uh, but um, that seems to have been just the way it developed. And, and I'm not saying that's bad. Those qualifications are very similar to the qualifications that we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where there it was uh, qualifications for the overseer. Um, here they're, they're called elders. So I, I think it's the same group that are mentioned. But then as we come to verse 10, uh, Paul gives a problem that Titus is facing. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So the problem now is that you have some false teachers, verse 11, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid game. So you have the problem of rebellion men. Uh, next, the testimony of rebellious men. Verse 12, one of themselves, um, one of these false teachers, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. You say, you can't really say that. That's politically incorrect. Well, Paul says it anyway. And he's quoting an old Cretan poet from hundreds of years earlier, uh, by the name of Epimenides. We actually have some of his writings, so, so we know from where the quote comes. Uh, and he says, uh, here's the saying about, about uh, people from Crete. Now, he's not saying every single person is like that, but there's a, there's a tendency among them. Uh, verse 13, this testimony is true. <laughs> uh, what's more, there was some truth to that characterization. Uh, For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. And then he goes from there to the solution. It's to reprove them, um, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Apparently, there were some issues like we saw in the epistle to the Colossians where uh, Jewish, not, not just Judaism, although that was might have been part of it, but Jewish myths, that maybe is Jewish mysticism uh, at its worst in this case, uh, who were turning people from the truth. And so he warns them, don't go there. Next, we come to chapter 2, where we're going to see uh, instructions to various groups, chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine, or we, we would say healthy teaching. 
Um, and then he addresses the older men who are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love and perseverance. Next, the older women, likewise to be reverent in their behavior, not, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, uh, teaching what's good that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, um, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Notice how he's hitting every area of society. Old men, young women, old women, young women, young, women, young men. Uh, and then he says, verse 7, in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds. So Titus himself serves as an example. Um, then he turns in verse 9 to slaves, urge bond slaves. That's the same term, the same term he used earlier to describe himself, uh, a slave of God. Uh, urge, urge slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, something we've seen Paul talk about in a number of epistles. To be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, not, that is not stealing, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn, and here's our term, notice, they are to adorn the doctrine of God or Savior in every respect. And I think the idea is that we are all to adorn the uh, doctrine of God. Uh, that is, when people look at us, they ought to say, if that's what a Christian is, I find that quite winsome. That's a wonderful way to live. And so slaves are, are described in such a way, uh, this entire group. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, I'm going to look at a few different translations here. Uh, the King James Version says, for the grace of God that appeared, salvation hath appeared to all men. Did you notice the difference in the New American Standard from which we've been reading? Uh, it's the grace, it's salvation that was brought to all men. In the Old King James, for the grace of God that appeared bringing salvation has appeared to all men. Um, you say, well, which is it? Well, let's look at a few other translations. The NIV 2011, um, and I think the newest one that just came out uh, last year probably follows the same route. Uh, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. They, they wanted to be gender neutral, so they ch changed men to people. But notice, it's, it's saying basically the same thing that the NAS uh, is saying. Uh, but the older NIV, <laughs> I have a copy on my shelf uh, that used to belong to Paula. Uh, I have sort of confiscated it, and she got a newer Bible. Uh, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That, that's actually the same thing that the old King James had. Uh, now, how is it read? Let me give you my own translation. Now, this is my translation. I'm going to read it twice, putting the emphasis a little bit different each time I read it. Here goes. For the grace of God appeared to all men, bringing salvation. Okay, second time. For the grace of God appeared to all men, bringing salvation. Did you hear the difference? <laughs> Depending on where I put the emphasis, you can have either meaning. Again, let me give you the first time. For the grace of God appeared to all men, bringing salvation. Notice I'm saying that it appeared to all men. Second time, for the grace of God appeared to all men bringing salvation. See? Second time, it's, you know, that, that it was bringing salvation to, to everyone. Which is in view, I think they, they both sort of work. Uh, I'm not arguing for either one, but that actually accounts sometimes for translational differences where the Greek text can be taken either way, which is why I worded it this way. Let's look at the passage in its, in its entirety, and I'm going to try to not take sides on that. Uh, but notice how the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny certain things, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. So the grace of God, as it comes, it teaches us, it instructs us, but it also teaches us not just what to deny, but also how to live, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the pre present age. Looking, it teaches us to live looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're to be looking for him, looking for Christ Jesus, who gave himself to redeem us. Remember what redemption is? That's, that's God coming and, and purchasing us and then setting us free uh, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, and that's us, it's interesting that um, back in Exodus chapter 19, uh, God promised Israel, you're going to be my own possession. You're going to be my own special people. And yet here, those words are applied not just to Jewish people, 
not just to Jewish Christians, but to us as well who believe. Zealous for good deeds. And so he came to redeem us and to purify us and to make us his people. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, gave us instructions to various groups. Chapter, the rest of chapter 2 uh, talked about how we're to be looking uh, for the appearing of Jesus. And now we come to chapter 3, where we're going to talk about living in the light of Jesus. So chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Remember back in verse 14, we we're told uh, that he had, he had uh, redeemed us and purified us, a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Uh, same term, uh, good deeds here. Um, so we're to be doing that, uh, those good deeds, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Verse 3, for we also once were foolish ourselves. Now, the reason for good works is because we were foolish, but, verse 4, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of works that we have done, uh, not, not on the basis of our, our deeds, uh, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Now, regeneration, that's, that's the new birth, being born again, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So notice we've had both a regeneration, a new birth, but also a renewing, and the Holy Spirit brings them both. Uh, the Holy Spirit does both of those. Whom he poured out upon us, not only are we renewed, but we receive the Holy Spirit. That, that, that renews us from the inside out. Uh, it sort of enlivens us uh, richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, verse 7, so that being justified by his grace, remember, to be justified, that's being declared righteous uh, by what he has accomplished in us and for us, that we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Uh, that's just a power-packed passage. Um, and so, big idea there, he saved us, and that's why we are doing good works. Verse 8, this is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. Do you see how many times that, that phrase, good deeds, back in chapter 2, verse 14, again in, in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, we saw it again, um, verse 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds that we have done, but now be careful to engage in those good deeds, in those good works. These are good and profitable for men. And so there's a call to do that, but also a warning, but avoid, this verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strifes and disputes about the law. It doesn't mean you can't look up to see who your grandfather was. Um, not that about genealogies, but don't get, don't be arguing about biblical genealogies. Those things aren't worth arguing about. They are unprofitable and worthless. I'm not saying don't study the Bible, but don't get into disputes that take you nowhere. Um, and there were apparently people that were doing that. So verse 10, he says, reject a factious man, a man who creates factions, a man who creates divisions, after a first and second warning. So uh, you say you're creating divisions. You don't just say, well, you're out of the church, uh, but you warn them. And notice a first and second, you even, even warn them again. But then, <laughs> Hey, it's time for you to go be somewhere else. Verse 11, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So a rejection of those who cause divisions. Now, verse 12, when we're almost done with the epistle, uh, Paul says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis. Nicopolis is on the west side of Greece. It's on the, Greek, the western Greek coast. For I have decided to spend the winter there. Uh, which suggests to me that if if he had left Titus on Crete um, during that that trip to Rome, uh, if that's the case, and I'm not I'm not saying that it is, but if that's the case, then that means that Paul was later released from prison and now is planning on meeting up with him in Western Greece, uh, Nicopolis. Uh, he's going to spend the winter there. Verse 13, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking to them. Verse 14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds. So there's another reference to good deeds again. And this is actually a practical exercise where he's been talking to them, he's been talking to Titus and the uh, 
church churches that Titus is going to go and visit uh, about good deeds, but here's something very practical they can do. Uh, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So go ahead and help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. In other words, there's something very practical you can do. Verse 15, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the truth. Grace be with you all. And let me give you that same um, benediction. Grace be with you all who are listening to this, to this, to this talk. 